But instead what you've got is over-focus on running the government and an under-focus on leading the culture. So if you look at them all together, notice where we place those. The four roles of a leader. First, the top one is to set the agenda, to communicate goals and standards. The second one is to convey symbolic power. The third is to gather resources. Only fourth comes managing your own system. Now let me show you how this works at, at, at three major levels. The President of the United States sets the agenda for the nation by leading the American people, symbolizes, symbolizes the American nation, is the head of the American community, and manages the American government. But that's his least important job. By contrast, a governor sets the agenda for the state by leading the people of the state, symbolizes the state, is the head of the state community, and manages the state government. But again, notice the thing we normally report on is the least important of their assignments. At a local level, a mayor sets the agenda for the city by leading the people of the city, symbolizes the city, is the head of the city community, and manages the city government. And we don't train our leaders to understand that their most important jobs are not the government part. It's the leadership part. Now what will happen is Toffler's third wave information revolution will lead to new forms of citizenship and community. And everybody, I think, gets to play in this. I mean, just as the founding fathers were codifying the second wave transition from agriculture to industry, and in a sense you can see the rise of the Constitution as an effort to figure out how humans live together in that setting, every American can be asked, what is your vision of 21st century citizenship and community? And you can start thinking about it as you see everything that's changing around you, how are we going to operate? What, how is the system going to evolve? And then what are the right strategies to implement that vision? Once we start figuring out whether it's town hall meetings or it's computers or it's volunteerism or whatever it is, and I think this takes a lot of discussion. And then finally, what projects and tactics will implement your vision and your strategies? Now that's the dialogue, I think, of the next four or five years. And it's a dialogue that the entire nation has to be involved in. Because in essence, what is at stake is doing the hard work of freedom that we have to say to a generation, to quote Franklin Delano Roosevelt, that we have a rendezvous with destiny and that we have to be re-engaged in rebuilding our understanding of America and creating it. And it starts in part with myths. Remember, every civilization has heroic myths because that's how people teach themselves. I mean, one of the most famous, frankly, is David defeating Goliath. It's a very important part of the Bible. And it's a very important sense of mythology. Here's this young kid, he goes out there, and because he's on the right side, he kills this giant, and therefore, as described in the Bible, the good guys win. We we'll go back and read that, and think about all the different lessons that are inherent in that, in terms of why you should have courage. Why, as long as you're right, as long as you're standing for the right side, you should take an interest. In the Roman tradition, it was Horatio at the bridge. The idea of the, of the individual who stood there, and who stood off the enemy, and who saved the society, even at the risk of their life. That gets modernized in our system with Patrick Henry, the school teacher who said, give me liberty or give me death. I think he was 23 at the time. And imagine the courage, you, you get captured by the British, you're a spy, and they say, do you have any final words? I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm sorry, I wasn't thinking Patrick Henry, I was thinking Nathan Hale, which I'll get to in a second. But Patrick Henry, in a sense, sets up Nathan Hale, because Patrick Henry in his speech says, give me liberty or give me death. And you're going to see this in the series. The, set, the next one is John Paul Jones, who says, I have not yet begun to fight when the British were sinking his ship. So he had to actually capture their ship in the fight. Then you get to, to Nathan Hale, uh, not, uh, who says, my only regret is that I have but one life to give for my country. Now in a sense, look at the pattern. From David who goes down as a young man risking everything for his, uh, for his team, to Horatio at the bridge who risked everything for Rome, to Patrick Henry who says, give me liberty or give me death, to John Paul Jones who's a figure of heroic courage. And again, imagine what schools would be like in the inner city if this kind of heroism were taught again. If young children learned, well, of I mean, tell me how hard your problem is. You think it's as hard as Nathan Hale's? I mean, they hung him. You think the fight you're involved in is dramatically worse than John Paul Jones? His ship was sinking. But there was a spirit which is at the heart of a free society, a spirit of enormous courage. 
In Washington's case, frankly, it's his nobility. But Washington comes to personify the sense of duty, honor, country, which is at the heart of a free society. And then Washington, who is in some ways a very austere figure, particularly because he's an older man by the time he's president, Washington then is matched in the pantheon of American heroes by Lincoln. And I think it's because of Abraham Lincoln's compassion and martyrdom, the fact that he's killed at the very end of the war at Ford's Theater. But when you look at the Lincoln figure, I mean, and these, these again are literally, I mean, I'm using myth here in the best anthropological sense, an organizing story which helps the society tell itself about life. And so you go from the nobility and courage of Washington to Lincoln's dedication and compassion, the sense that Lincoln bled for every person killed in the war on both sides. That he thought it was a terrible, if you read his second inaugural, if you come to Washington, go to the monument and read the second inaugural. You feel the pain. And so you capture the spirit. And then with the emergence of America as the leading industrial power in the world, what more perfect mythology than Teddy Roosevelt charging up San Juan Hill? And if you ever get to see a fine little movie called The Wind and the Lion, which has a just brilliant portrait by Brian Keith of Theodore Roosevelt, you get this sense of that he was the perfect evocation of an emerging, optimistic, buoyant, adventurous America. Remember I read earlier that uh, he's the first president to ride in a car, and there's a newspapers congratulating him for his courage in actually riding in a car. Uh, remember that he, he doesn't shoot the, 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 the baby bear that they've, ca they've captured, and so that the invention of the teddy bear. You could argue that in some ways he may have been the most popular person ever to be president, just as an individual. And yet he personified this explosion of energy that is America at the turn of the century. We, as I've said before, we get into the Depression. The country has deep doubts. There is a tremendous collapse of belief in America. And then on a rainy morning on March 4, 1933, a man who is in braces gets up and says, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And literally, you see just the country begins to relax. And I mean, one of the great stories of modern times, I was talking to a still photographer the other day, was saying, they never showed FDR in a wheelchair because they had a sense of the dignity of the presidency, and they had a sense of his personal dignity. And here's a man who, by sheer will and discipline, stood in his braces. And if you, if you watch, he, I, I saw the other day of some footage of him walking to the podium that day. And he has somebody on each side helping him, because the truth is he could barely, he couldn't move his legs. And it's a remarkable effort of sheer will. And yet, he comes out of all this, having been through polio, having been told basically, I mean, his wife strongly wanted him to quit. And, and his family wanted him to quit. He works his way back. He gets a call from Al Smith who says, we have to have you on the ticket to run for governor in 1928. He believes in his heart he's beginning to learn to walk again. And he's faced with a choice, do I serve my party, run for governor, and probably never walk the rest of my life? Or do I stay out of politics and recover? And they say, you've got to do it. You know, and so he runs, he wins, when Smith is losing the, the presidency. And then four years later, he's not just a man of enormous discipline, but he does something, I, I don't know if any other American politicians have ever done it. He has an automatic, contagious, buoyant optimism. You see it twice. First is the Depression. The country's a mess, 25% unemployment. And FDR just picks the country up. Goes back to this. He leads by faith. He leads the country by just creating a mood that is amazing that we can do it. And then, of course, it recreates it in 1941 at Pearl Harbor. And no matter how bad things were the first six months of World War II, he was always optimistic. He was always positive. We were going to get there. And, of course, in a way, his direct psychological descendant, a Reagan Democrat turned Republican, is Ronald Reagan. And if you think of, of uh, we have every right to dream heroic dreams. And he, he, sa he says at two different places in, in, in his first inaugural, we have every right to dream heroic dreams. After all, we are Americans. And you have the same buoyant, positive sense. Now, I want to wrap up this part by, by, by bringing together two different feelings. One, this is a great country with a good people. Optimism, buoyancy, positivism makes sense. Two, life is hard and freedom's frustrating that underpinning the optimism is brute hard work. 
underpinning the sense that we're a good people is a very tough-minded willingness to stop the ones who don't want to be good people. And it's, a del it's, it's complex. It's not, it's not obvious or simple or easy. And yet that's the magic that for 300 years has grown the process of freedom. And to go back to where we started with Chamberlain, we got a, a section from, from, uh, uh, from Burns's fabulous The Civil War I want to share with you. This is a letter written by Sullivan Ballou to his wife. And again, I want you to listen to this letter and think about what we're asking. We're saying to you in peacetime, you have to take responsibility. You have to give some of your time. You have to be willing to be an American, which is an act of being. It means you've got to invest yourself in your community, in your neighbors, in your children, in your parents. You have to do things to be an American. 